pandemic preparedness, well, prevention preparedness and response. I'm very honoured to being asked to be your moderator. I chair an independent panel which since the end of 2020 has been advocating for a global public health convention, so you'll see why that makes sense here. Um, it's so good to see the room so full. Um, great to have ministers in the room um, to listen to, this, uh, to, to the various speakers because I think you're going to get a very good overview of where, as it were, things are in all these negotiations. And great to have members of delegations and stakeholders here, of course, as well. Now, this is, as we've been hearing, I think, um, even as you, since you started yesterday, this is a very important moment in the work to deliver a pandemic accord and the amendments to IHR and a UN General Assembly political declaration. And that, of course, is quite a lot of work to bring off. And we have just the one year until we reach the World Health Assembly next year when we should be completing all of this. Now, it really is vital that we do reach that point next May. Speaking as somebody from outside WHO, I would say that all our people across the world actually deserve to have the treaty and other matters in hand then so that we can really make progress. You all know that as we are now, we are still at high risk. We know that animal to human transmission, particularly of viruses, will continue to happen. But we can stop outbreaks becoming pandemics and we can actually manage pandemics better than we did last time if we really work on this, the treaties and the agreements that we're going to make now. They are really what the negotiations are all about. So I would remind you, going back to COVID, of the issue about the need for urgent action at times of pandemics or outbreaks. We remember then that we should have worked in hours and days and not in weeks and months. And I would like to encourage you to see the negotiations in the same way. It's not something we can just wait and see about and push forward. We really do need to see that happening now. Now, personally, I do believe that with all your goodwill, your solidarity and your willingness to compromise, that can be done. And when I say compromise, I don't mean lowest common denominator. I mean finding a way through that actually delivers for what everyone wants. But we know that's going to be a lot of work. Now, I don't want to say much more because we have nine speakers, I think, this afternoon. And each of them is going to speak for certainly no more than five minutes. And I hope they will all forgive me because I am going to have to stop people if they go on, or we will never get to the end of nine. And I do want to have time at the end for you to come back in with comments yourselves on all the things that you've heard. But I do think this is going to be a very uh, useful and, and I, I hope inspiring approach to how we can get <laughs> movement and deliver what we need to do. And of course, the first person I'm going to let speak to you is, of course, your um, Director General, um, Dr. Tedros, and look forward to hearing what he's got to say to lead us off. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Barbara. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, thank you for joining us today. We are honored to be joined by their Excellencies, Secretary Becerra, Minister Dechen Wagmo, Ambassador Hilal, co-chairs Asiri and Dreis, and my sister uh, Yodi Alakija, and my brother Dr. Al Mandari uh, Ahmed. As we mark WHO's 75th birthday, the COVID-19 pandemic was a stark reminder of the words of our constitution that the health of all peoples is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent upon the fullest cooperation of individuals and states. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, member states have initiated several complementary processes to strengthen pandemic prevention, preparedness and response so that the world does not repeat the same mistakes that were made during this pandemic. 
We appreciate that the ongoing processes are as inclusive with the broadest participation of member states and relevant stakeholders. WHO has proposed to member states a framework for action for stronger governance, stronger financing, stronger systems and tools, and a stronger WHO at the center of the global health architecture. This includes work across five core areas. This morning I talked about the five P's. These are the five C's. Collaborative surveillance, community protection, safe and scalable clinical care, access to countermeasures, and emergency coordination. Today, I have four requests for you. First, I urge you to deliver the pandemic accord on time as a generational commitment. The next pandemic will not wait for us, and we must be ready. And this is the generation that experienced this dreadful pandemic that should write the pandemic agreement. Second, I urge you to focus on bold amendments to the international health regulations to improve their implementation. We must this seize this opportunity. By the way, when the U.S. proposed to reopen the international health regulations, many were spectacle, uh, skept skeptical, but now many agree that it was the right uh, thing to do. So thank you to the U.S. for recommending the reopening of the amendment of the International Health Regulation. Sir, I urge you to ensure that any outcome of the high-level meeting on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response in September supports and does not undermine the member state-led process in Geneva. And fourth, I urge you to keep WHO at the center of the global health architecture and equity a driving force for change. In a world of overlapping and converging crises, we need an effective architecture for health emergency preparedness and response that will address not only the pandemics of the future, but health emergencies of all kinds. As we recover from the collective trauma of COVID-19, we must work together to build a new future that's equitable, inclusive, and coherent. I thank you, Chair, and back to you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, we're now going to move to hear something about the processes of all the three areas that are being that we're, we're currently working on, and that will begin with uh, Roland uh, uh, Dries, who is the co-chair of the INB, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body. So, um, Roland, if you'd like to take the floor. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, I don't have to remind you, but in 2021, the COVID pandemic was still raging ruthlessly. And in times when global solidarity and cooperation was so much needed, we found that we had hardly any systems or tools in place to provide for just that. So global leaders and experts from around the world called for a pandemic treaty. And later that year, all countries collectively decided to start negotiations for such an instrument in the hope that we will be better prepared for next future pandemics. Um, in style, uh, as we always do that uh, for international treaties, uh, an international negotiation body, in short, IMB, was created. And a bureau representing all 60 regions of the WHO was, was established to facilitate our negotiations. And I have the honor, together with my colleague uh, Precious Matsoso from South Africa, to chair this process in the hope that we will deliver something by next year. Because the aim of our work is to come up with a global treaty with binding and non-binding elements that will address many of the shortcomings we have witnessed, preventing against, preparing for, and responding to future pandemics. That's the aim of everything we try to do. And there are many issues we have to tackle in that respect, or could tackle in that respect, but we started from scratch, actually, and asked member states and civil society what they thought were the most pressing issues to handle. And that provided us with a, with a rich compilation of ideas of which we try to make now a legal text so we can really start negotiating upon them. And there are many points countries agree upon, but there are also, as to be expected in these kind of processes, issues that require more discussion. 
And unfortunately, we have only given ourselves till next WHA, next year May, to finish all this work. And, and that's not easy. And to complicate things even more, member states have also decided to simul simultaneously improve the international health regulations, the IHR. And that's also very important because the IHR and the IMB are actually two complementary sides of the same coin. The difficult question is only what to, do, what to deal with where, in which instrument do we do what? Because what we see currently are overlapping discussions on both instruments and in, in my view, uh, delineation is much needed so we can um, progress with the, the needed work in both processes. Yeah, the IHR originally requires countries to report on disease outbreaks, stipulate what countries need to do to strengthen their public health capacities and to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. So what is there then left for the IMB to do? Well, everything that we all feel that is needed for a next pandemic and what is ideally not arranged as well in the IHR. To give you a flavor of what is on our table, um, equity in relation to the access to medical countermeasures or vaccines, the swift sharing of pathogenic information and data, improving logistical systems for deploying medical countermeasures in time of pandemics, more and coordinated R&D, helping each other in living up to the agreements we will hopefully um, establish and making funds available to finance it all because uh, without money, things are not too easy to get from the ground. And this is not all, but there's much more, but just, this is just to give you a flavor of the, the many uh, challenging things on our, on our plate. And this week, uh, many of you will probably know that the Bureau will share a next Bureau's text in which we have tried to collect all the main elements that have been suggested for a treaty. Where views, on where views converge, we have made that clear, but as to be expected, member states are not on the same page on everything, so where there is diverging opinions, we will have included options so people can recognize the discussion points which we will have to tackle um, in the months to come. And through this, I hope and I trust that the Bureau will facilitate the member states in the work that will need to get done in the next 10 months. But, and there's always a but, and the but in this time, in this, in this instance is, um, it doesn't matter how hard we work, but this process will only be successful if we keep up the momentum, if we keep up the political urgency. Some people might think that now the pandemic is over, we do not need to rush anymore towards a treaty. But again, losing political momentum might be the biggest mistake we could make in this respect. So hopefully in September during the UNGA session in New York, I hope that member states will recommit themselves to the, to the cause we're having. So we will hear a little bit later about that. Um, but let's not forget what seemed so logical two years ago establishing an instrument through which we collaborate in the world in order to prevent against, prepare for, and respond to pandemics. Let us not forget the many lives lost during the last COVID pandemic. Let us work together and try to save as many of us as possible whenever a new pandemic might come around again. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland, and thank you, and I think also Precious Matsozo for the, your leadership of this very complex negotiation. And now alongside you, of course, you have the co-chair there, uh, Dr. Asiri, who is co-chair on the uh, changes, amendments to the international health regulations, if you'd like to pick up from there. Thank you very much. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Director General, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abdullah Asiri from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and I'm the co-chair of the working group on the International Health Regulation Amendments. Uh, on behalf of the working group uh, and the uh, WGIHR Bureau, I'm delighted to join uh, the strategic roundtable. Ladies and gentlemen, it was evident that in light of COVID-19, the world must take actions to better protect itself from future pandemics and health crises. In an effort to make the world a safer place, member states and communities they represent have decided to, um, to move forward with uh, simultaneous uh, processes. 
Since the IHR 2005 is the only legally binding document we have in hand, it was a prime candidate for enhancement. The IHR plays a critical role in protecting public health and promoting global health security by ensuring that countries are able to detect, assess, and respond to public health threats in a timely and effective manner. It has been 16 years since IHR 2005 was enforced. The IHR implementation has, has been the most problematic component of the process. But the world has changed since then and enhancements in other areas of IHR are required. For that purpose, the working group on IHR amendments was established. In November 2022, the working group held its first meeting to elect the officers of the Bureau, organize aspects of the working group on amendments to the International Health Regulation, review the proposed method of work, and discuss its coordination with the IMB to draft and negotiate a WHO convention, agreements, or other international instruments on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Ladies and gentlemen, since then, the WGIHR has achieved the following. One, member states has read through the 300 proposed amendments to the IHR and grouped them into tracks to facilitate negotiations and text finalization. Second, it held a series of bureau-to-bureau -bureau meeting to align with the IMB. Third, it facilitated several informal intersessional activities with mem where member states discussed and aligned proposed amendments. Ladies and gentlemen, the proposed amendment to the IHR call for introducing equity and developing robust and comprehensive implementation and compliance processes for the IHR. As far as the discussion have gone, the IHR amendments and the IMP processes are seen as complementary and mutually beneficial. Implementing the amended IHR shall enable member states to detect, prevent, and respond to pul public health emergencies and reduce the chance of pandemics. The world, however, requires a different level of legal mandates, such as the pandemic treaty to navigate through a particular pandemic, should one occur, and it will. Prioritizing actions that may restrict individual liberties, mandating and sharing of information, knowledge and resources, and most importantly, providing fund for pandemic control efforts are all necessary during a pandemic. The means to carry out these actions are simply not carried, at, not currently at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the path ahead is arduous, but we are making progress. The commitment made by member states to uphold and strengthen the IHR serves as an inspiration for the work of the WG IHR. The final package of proposed amendments for the WG IHR process will be submitted to the Director General in January 2024 for consideration by the 77th World Health Assembly. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atiri, and I'd like to also just add in our thanks to um, Dr. Bloomfield, your partner in the, as co-chair in the work you've both been doing um, on the uh, IHR. Uh, now, our third process that's going on uh, is uh, from, for the, from the UN, and the, this is for the, uh, uh, the high-level meeting and the uh, political declaration. And we have here Ambassador Hilali, who is one of the two co-facilitators of that process. So I think this may be a bit more new to more people in the room, and so that would be really, I think, very helpful to understand how that fits into this, this group. Thank you very much, Dan Barbara. Mr. Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here with you this afternoon in the margin of WHA 76. I'm equally honored to take part in this strategic roundtable, which brings us together to discuss three historical and critical processes that will help the world get ready for the pandemics of the future. As just Barbara said, we are at a very important moment. Indeed, this round table is critical, as it is for the first time the three major intergovernmental processes that are at the core of the strengthening and improving global health architecture 
are brought together for discussion and direction. This demonstrates that health is not just a Geneva or New York issue, but highly uh, important world issue that requires a global multi-sectoral, multi faith approach where all countries, government, UN agencies, civil society, and other stakeholders have an important play to, role to play. The three processes that the General Assembly have, uh, the, the general uh, high level meeting will be the first signal from the signal from the international community on this global health issue, which is both privilege and responsibility. It will also be the first ever UN General Assembly high level meeting on PPPR at the head of states and governmental level. This is unprecedented and historical. And along with my fellow the ambassador of Israel, we are taking this responsibility very seriously. Since our appointment, we have been having consultations with member states, UN entities, and all the other relevant stakeholders and partners. We came to Geneva in February, where we met with the INB Bureau and briefed member states on our work and met with WHO Director General, WTO Director General, WIPO Director General, and many other Geneva-based entities, as well as the DDG of the UNIDO. We participated in the multi-stakeholder hearing on PPPR that the President of the General Assembly in New York had on 9th of May. We welcome all the inputs and views shared in that hearings and we look forward to reading the meeting summary. Additionally, I continued consultations over the past week in Geneva, again, including a meeting with the co-chairs of the working groups on I, uh, at, uh, HR amendments, we think with the, a meeting with the Secretary General of the IFRC, as well as several meetings with the senior management of ILO, ICRC, Gavi, and the private sector, including pharmaceutical companies. These consultations and discussions will help the co-facilitators and our team to draft the political declaration for which we will start negotiating, inshallah, on the 7th of June. The political declaration will be a consensus document, concise and action-oriented, with the aim to lend the highest level of political support to PPPR to reaffirm and strengthen the central role of WHO, which is key to the global health architecture as enshrined in its constitution, as the directing and coordinating authority on international health work, including pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response, and to lend support to the work of the INB and working group on IHR amendments. The political declaration should not preempt any way in any way the work of the INB and its final document or outcome that is to be delivered in May 2024, nor the work of the uh, uh, IHR. It aims to give momentum and generate political will of our head of states for the Geneva process. As we stressed to the Director General of the WHO, to the INB Bureau, and to the co-chair working group of, in HR, to member states and other partners. The process in New York will provide the enabling environment for international community to be better prepared for the pandemics of the future. Our ultimate goal is not to reinvent the wheel or create duplicative or unnecessary mechanisms or processes. We know that the tools are here. We just need to enable them and this is what we still strive to achieve in New York. With this approach, we can contribute to strengthening pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response, and further strengthen and empower the World Health Organization to play its central role, as well as ensure that all member states are prepared for the next pandemic, and that the women and men on the ground delivering much needed healthcare services, community, workers, researchers, scientists, teachers, first responders are all provided the support and tools needed to carry out their very important and very noble work. We have an opportunity with the political declaration 
to have a strong action-oriented outcome that the head of states and governments will commit to and create the enabling environment for the real work to be done. That's why I urge all member states to come together so we can have the strongest declaration possible in New York. We owe it to the world. We owe it to the seven million people we have lost through the COVID-19 pandemic, and we owe it to our children and our grandchildren. And since today you are in the presence of the Minister of Health, I invite you and encourage you all to participate in the high-level meeting to be held during the high-level week in September 20. I also want to note that along with PPPR, we also have high-level meeting on UHC and TB. And it is important to show that health is central and integral to the work of the United Nations and to achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Hilali, for all your work on this as well. And also, I think we should thank the Ambassador from um, Israel as well, who joined you as the co-facilitator. Having heard the three uh, lines of work that are taking place, we're now coming to a part where we're going to get some comments on, uh, from, but first of all, from countries, but from other bodies as well, as just for the, to the second part of what we're doing. But the first country that's going to um, sort of speak for us um, is the US. And uh, we have here Secretary Becerra, who is, many of you will know, from the, the Secretary from the Department of Health and Human Services. And so we'd like to hear from you about how you see these negotiations going and what's important, if you could. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Barbara. Uh, and to Director General Tedros, uh, Excellencies, uh, the U.S., I want to begin by saying, is committed to strengthening health security and preparing for future threats. That means being able to prevent, detect, and respond to pandemics and other health security threats, as well as advance global health priorities overall. To us, it's very important that we focus on preparing for future public health emergencies and preventing them. The United States is committed to preparedness prior priorities that include the following five goals. Strengthen biosurveillance uh, bio and data systems for early warning to biological threats. Prevent biological incidents from naturally occurring, accidental, and deliberate sources. And prevent outbreaks from becoming epidemics through strengthened global health security. Three, strengthen domestic and global preparedness, including through investments in development, manufacturing, and deployment of medical countermeasures and strengthen the public health workforce. Four, ensure that we are all prepared to rapidly respond to any biological incident. And five, enhance our capabilities to recover from such biological incidents. President Biden's proposal in his budget for fiscal year 2024 includes a multi-billion dollar investment to make sure America is prepared for the next public health crisis. And within that budget, he includes $1.6 billion for global health action. We are very heartened that the pandemic fund has gotten off to a great start. President Biden has been a champion of the fund from the very beginning. The U.S. previously committed $450 million and called on all parties to commit financial, political, and technical support to ensure the fund's success. And just this week, I am pleased to highlight that President Biden committed an additional $250 million to the fund. It is an investment in our global and national security that will yield significant economic and health dividends for years to come. But more investment is needed. We all share responsibility for making sure we are prepared for future public health challenges. It is important that funding is diversified and that we pursue cutting edge science and game changing innovation together. New public health challenges are emerging and we must all be better prepared. We know that the challenges we face won't be solved by a few leaders or a few countries, but by the world coming together and fighting for what's right. The United States is here to continue our work to strengthen global health collaboration, improve systems for monitoring disease or pandemic outbreaks, bolster national health security capacities, and enhance equity in pandemic preparedness and responses. 
we are deeply committed to all the issues being discussed at WHA 76 on pandemic preparedness and response, whether it's the work of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the International Health Regulations, or the Pandemic Fund. And we concur with Director General Tedros, we must make progress. The United States very much looks forward to our continued partnership on these issues, and I wish to stress from our perspective, the quicker we can come together, the sooner we will all be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary, for that, for that very strong commitment. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Minister Wang No from Bhutan to come in from a rather different part of the world and a rather different size. So it would be interesting to get the, uh, a bit of comparison about the ideas that people are thinking about. Um, thank you, Barbara. Um, it's an honor for me to be part of this panelist. I think listening to my previous speaker, I can only share um, our humble small story uh, Bhutan, um, as you may not know, is a small country wedged between China and India, China in the north and India in the south. We are a population of 700,000 uh, 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 people. Uh, Bhutan was known for its vaccination. I think it made a global mark when we achieved 94% uh, vaccination coverage in seven days, uh, COVID vaccine, uh, and we were able to avert a major public health crisis despite a very fragile health system. I have one ICU doctor in the country. If you look at population to doctor ratio, some of my district stands at one doctor per 6,000 population. But yet again, we averted a major public health crisis. And today when I stand here and reflect back on what worked for Bhutan, and I'm sure there are many small countries like Bhutan who is also feeling the same sentiment as I am. Um, for us, smallness. Smallness was our strength because we could achieve what we want to achieve because we were small. Second, science. All along, we believed in science. Wearing a mask was not a political statement for Bhutanese. Getting vaccinated was science, not a belief. And the last one, is solidarity. Bhutan launched a response under the benevolent leadership of His Majesty the King, who at the hem of this response managed to bring everyone together. I think standing in my ministry, I got multiple calls from various sector of the community wanting to help, offering me what can they do to help the country. In that period, of adversity, we as a small nation realized that this small country that we call home was at threat and that we all have to take our responsibility. So the personal responsibility that came through this sense of solidarity is very important. Last but not the least is uh, something that I have advocated during the WHA presidentship is humanitarian corridor. Bhutan, for example, is a small country that is highly dependent on many countries. We buy, we import everything, especially in the, in the health sector. Neither do we have the human resources, nor the pharmaceutical power to produce drugs, nor the resources to import. So when we realized that the country started putting bans and embargoes on medical equipment and drugs, I think we were in a panic mode. And I think many smaller countries went through the same pain that we did. So this is where I think it's so important to acknowledge that there were some things that we have done wrong. And it is uh, these things that needs correction at the moment. So when we look at uh, our experiences today, you know, our mortality was 21, of which 20 of them had terminal illness. We look at infection. We have managed to, because of vaccination, we managed to prevent massive uh, community transmission. And it is through this journey that we have learned 
that disease knows no boundaries, that we all must be in it together to find solutions to what we are doing. I think for us, um, as a small nation, um, it was very emotional to go through this pain and realize how vulnerable we are as a small nation. So it was during that time that we said, as we go forward, we must invest in health security, build the competency and the capacity of our own people, invest um, in building a resilient health system in the country, but that will entail support from many partners uh, and, and, and bigger countries to invest. So we welcome the pandemic fund, which is also providing support for many countries, I hope, will, who will build and prepare for the next pandemic. We stand at a critical juncture in the history, the establishment of the intergovernmental negotiation uh, body, the creation of the working group to amend the IHR, International Health Regulation, and the convening of the high-level meeting under the UNGA in September comes an, at the right time to fortify our pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response mechanisms. Let us seize this opportunity to foster international collaboration, ensure global health security, and protect the lives and the well-being of all people beyond boundaries. I believe that by working together, drawing upon our collective knowledge and experiences, and embracing the spirit of global solidarity, we can strengthen our response to any future pandemic. Let us leave no stone unturned in our effort to prevent, prepare, and respond to pandemic. Our commitment to the well-being of our nations and the world demands nothing less. I thank you. Very good. That was obviously seen by all of you as a very nice way of really thinking about what it's really like in the middle of it and on the ground. And I think it very thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Wang Mo, for actually putting on the table the issues of personal responsibility and, in a sense, the relationship with communities as well, because it's all very well sitting in this room, but there's also an awful lot to be done on the ground as well. So that's, that brings that in very nicely, I think. Now, our last speaker before we go um, into uh, the people making their own comments, is Dr. Uh, Abakijo, and she is um, the co-chair of the African Vaccine Delivery Alliance, but also WHO's special envoy on Act A. So another part of the, of the jigsaw, please. Thank you very much, Dame Barbara. Director General, Excellencies, it is an honor to be here today to remind us all that there is no time to waste, to remind us that PPR is all planning for pandemics is not an option, to remind us that the very next threat might be lurking in the slums of Agege in Lagos, Nigeria, where I come from, might be lurking in the slums of Kibera in Kenya or in the slums of, of, of Rio Janeiro somewhere. There is no time to waste, and as we sit in this very nice room, in this very nice city, talking about what, what we could or could not do, we must remember that there are people whose lives have been lost. We, by last count, approximately 22 million of them who died during the, last, the, the pandemic, which is still not over. The emergency has been declared over, but COVID is not yet done with us. So now is the time to act. Now is the time to act swiftly, to act with determination, to act with courage to act with humility and remember what went before. It is incredible to hear um, Her Excellency, the Minister of, of, of Bhutan's statements, and I've been long been a, a fan of the Kingdom of Bhutan, the National Happiness Index. It's where I want to end up when I, where I, when I grow up. You know, let's all go to Bhutan. What she said about science, about smallness, about solidarity, really has many, many lessons for us here. Because smallness can be, what, what you do in small places, I also, as part of my life, I have a part of my life in Fiji. And I've talked about that smallness and how we can replicate things that have been done on a small scale. 
but it is that solidarity, it is that personal responsibility, it is the extrication of politics from what is a public health threat. This virus doesn't care what country you're from or where you belong to or what your political affiliations are, and future viruses are not going to care either. So it is, it is an honor to be here today to remind us all, because to know and plan where we're going, it is important to remember where we have come from. I'm here today representing the AVDA, which was set up by the Africa Union Bureaus of Heads of State under the leadership of President Ramaphosa in 2020 as one of the three pillars of the African continental response. As you might recall, Africa was left behind. Africa and many other countries in the global south was left behind during COVID. What we're here to do and what we're here to talk about is ensuring that nobody gets left behind. But in that process, and as I speak to, 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 to my colleagues and my, my sister Precious and, and, and you, my dear brother Roland and, and many others who are, are working towards the IMB and the IHR and all of those processes, it is time for us to begin to knit those processes together in an inclusive manner. I'm here to speak to inclusive approaches. Why do we need to have everybody at the table? We need to have everybody at the table because nobody nobody knows where the shoe is pinching. It, unless you are the person wearing the shoe. So what is happening in Bhutan, it is important that we hear from small states and we hear from small island states so we understand what their pressures and what their pain points are. It is important that we hear from people from Africa who, who maybe have no access to medical countermeasures, who don't even know what those medical countermeasures are. In, I would, I, 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 as we talk about inclusive approaches, we must talk about inclusive responses also. Inclusive responses must ensure that everybody has the diagnostics, the vaccines, and the, the treatments that they need. Yesterday, I was asked at a session as we began this, this august meeting, what went wrong during COVID? I'm going to repeat that response to all of you because there is much power in this room. What went wrong was power, and what went wrong was greed. What went wrong was power and greed that made us lose mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children. We all in this room can touch somebody who was lost because we as a world chose to see a threat as a domestic, as a personal thing. We locked ourselves in our houses. We became completely insular, both as, both as individuals and as governments and as nations. And yet the threat was not each other. The threat was the virus. I'm here to say that the next threat is already upon us. It is not that it may come, it is that it is here, we just haven't found it yet. We haven't found it yet because we do not have the diagnostics capacities in the cities of, of, of Africa where, where I live or in, in, in some parts of, of Latin America where, where, where my brother, um, Dr. Barbosa, reminded me yesterday not to forget to advocate for Latin America also and for the Caribbean islands. There is inequity in this world, and as you all argue over it, the word equity and what it means within a text, let me tell you what inequity means. Inequity means Elizabeth, the young lady who was part of my household, who during COVID-19 at 11.30 at night, her children rang my house, crying because mummy could not breathe. Mummy was on the floor. The doctors had said she had malaria plus typhoid, but what she really had was COVID that had gone undiagnosed because of inequity. Elizabeth was a 34-year-old woman. She had four children, the youngest of whom was about four years old. Perhaps if we had looked at women, women's rights and women and children and the need to, to do vaccination studies for women during the pandemic and had had vaccines in Africa, she might be alive today. Elizabeth died about three hours later before my husband could get to the hospital to pay the $2,000 they required as a deposit. That is what inequity looks like, because too often we throw around these numbers and these figures, 22 million, 7 million, but no, there are Elizabeths, there are Johns, there are Uncle Tokes, there are Uncle, Uncle Tundes all over the world who have died during this pandemic. And why we're here and why the incredible people who are working here are doing this work, are, are working so assiduously is ensure that we do not re repeat this again. The next threat might not be so kind. If we take SARS-CoV-2 up one or two notches, it could be existential. It could be the one that ends us all. So I do urge you all, as I argue for inclusive approaches, as I argue for small island states, for, 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 for all voices to be around the table, I urge you all to act swiftly, to act with urgency, to act as though your own life were on the line. I thank you.
Thank you. Again, another um, insight into going or going back to the insight that we, that we know about, about what is really happening on the ground and what you really see when it happens and your argument for inclusivity. Very important, all voices. So that's, that's great. Thank you. So thank you all for putting all the different matters on the, on the table. Um, you have done extremely well in sticking to your time which is good because that does mean we can hear a lot from all of you out there in what's so been the audience. I've already got five um, uh, organisations or people who would wish to speak. Um, I'll let them, I'll tell you who they are in just a moment, but the, the others who of you have now decided that you would like to also speak, if you put your flags up, the Secretariat will make sure we capture who, who would like to come on. Now, the, the countries that I've got to in the first five that I know about are Canada, South Africa, then UNICEF, then France, and then the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. So I'm going to take those first. If we get, I'm assuming a lot of this will be comment uh, rather than um, questions, but if we do get questions, I will put them to the appropriate people as we go through. Uh, but first of all, then, if I could start from Canada, please. Where is Canada? So thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. And I think it's absolutely amazing to have the chairs of the IMB and the IHR uh, review, and also those playing a incredible role in facilitating the next um, high level meeting. I think from a Canada's perspective, we're definitely committed to taking a collaborative approach with uh, our multiple partners uh, on shared health priorities. And we see the urgency of what we need to do at this very pivotal moment. And that solving global problems needs the whole world to work together. I think that work, the work to strengthen the global architecture for health emergency preparedness, response and resilience should be grounded in a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder approach. But health leadership is absolutely critical and that the WHO sh should absolutely be at the center and playing a really critical role in this global health uh, architecture. We are very supportive of the discussions on the elaboration of a new global accountability framework because anything that we do should be accompanied by such a robust accountability framework that delivers concrete results to the people that we serve and support. We think that there is value in exploring independent review models that foster sh really shared learning, how we can all learn from each other, do better, and look at more creative and innovative solutions. So I was really happy to hear about the concept of um, these different uh, instruments or uh, processes being complementary or two sides to a coin with an enabling uh, mechanism. Because I think that's really helpful and hearing from each of you how what you're doing is complementary but serves different purposes. Uh, I do have a question as to whether there is any obvious gaps that are not being addressed by the work that you're doing, despite the fact that you know, so much is being done? And um, what would be the most, and if, if there are, um, what would be the most appropriate forum to address any of those gaps? And it's great that you're speaking to each other and trying to make sure that you're complementary. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to hold that question because we might get some others to, uh, in the moment. Um, can I ask uh, South Africa to speak, please? No. South Africa? Well, while we're waiting then, can I call UNITEF then instead? Uh, thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic had a dramatic effect on families, communities, young people, and on child rights, as we very meaningfully heard from uh, Dr. Ola Tunbosan Alakija. 
Increasing prevention, preparedness and response is a, a key step and UNICEF is committed to this area to support countries and in a way that is equitable and of relevance at sub-national level. Communities should be engaged and it was heartening to hear of the engagement of civil society in this process so far and wider societal issues need to be further considered including the education of children and protection from violence during pandemics. Global inequities for supply of relevant commodities is a further area that we've heard about and for further work, including the global supply chain and logistics, including for medical countermeasures. Uh, UNICEF looks forward to working with all parties on this agenda as it moves forward to ensure the rights of children and young people are upheld during this process. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, South Africa, any? Not, not here. Um, France then, please. Director General of the WHO, ministers, ambassadors, colleagues. At the outset, I would like to thank you for organizing this round table with such an important uh, title gathering the world together on PPPR. France is very much committed to the work underway on uh, global health architecture, and this is a very historic and important moment for us for global health architecture. This negotiation process is led by states, and it's taking place in a number of negotiating fora. Of course, here at the World Health Organization, which is at the heart of these negotiations, and to gather the international community, we need to be inclusive, and it is the case. It concerns stakeholders and states, but it also requires rigorous coordination. With regard to the pandemic agreement, together with the European Union, France is fully committed for a binding agreement which will enable us to better prevent and prepare with early uh, detection systems zoonoses and to guarantee access to medical countermeasures by ensuring local and regional capacity building and to be guided by the principle of one health with a link between human health, animal health and the health of ecosystems. In parallel, we have the amendment of the IHR and France is also invested in this process and these two processes are complementary. They are vital for ensuring a new framework to uh, prevent and prepare for new pandemics. That is incumbent upon all of us. It is a global process that also includes equitable access to medical countermeasures. The implementation of an ecosystem should enable equitable access to medical countermeasures and its governance must be inclusive. The issue of financing is also important when we talk about PPPR, with, for example, the establishment of new financing mechanisms, such as the pandemic fund at the World Bank, which France is contributing to. Its goal is to provide a response in terms of financing for, the pr for prevention and preparedness, and emergency funding must also be anticipated. It is by building collectively and by listening to one another's needs that we will better prevent and prepare for and respond to future pandemics. France will continue to be involved in this to guarantee the adoption of effective mechanisms by the end of 2024 and the high level meeting uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in September is an important moment for strengthening this negotiation process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, please? Barbara, the GPMB is closely monitoring progress in these critically important reforms and processes to strengthen prevention, preparedness, and response to pandemics. It is imperative that they succeed, and we have proposed three tests of these reforms, which we published in our, in our Manifesto for Preparedness earlier this year. That, that they are sufficiently positively powered, that they will deliver equity and coherence, 
and do they have robust mechanisms for monitoring and accountability, embed, accountability embedded in them? But we have an additional proposal to ensure their success. We feel very strongly that we cannot wait for the next emergency to find out how well the pandemic accord and the AIHR amendments will work. We need to know now. We therefore suggest that member states together with other key stakeholders carry out a simulation exercise based on the draft accord and the draft IHR amendments later this year before they are finalized and adopted. It can provide assurance of their effectiveness, help us all as a global community to identify any remaining gaps and resolve any outstanding areas of disagreement. A simulation exercise beforehand and robust monitoring and accountability following their adoption are two ways you can ensure these important instruments fulfill their potential and that we are ready for the next pandemic. We plead with you to give this proposal your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joy, on that one. Um, before I go to the next round, um, would anybody like to comment on the first, anything on the first one, including the comment, the question from Canada about are there any gaps? It's like, I think people are so mired up to here, I'm not sure they would think find any gaps at the moment, but it, um, would either of you on looking at the, the, you know, the two negotiations like to comment on that? Yes, well, um, I would think that there will always be gaps, and not so much that we have forgotten about subjects, but it's more the, the way we, ex the extensiveness of, of how deep we go into that. Eh? For example, when we talk about preventing pandemics from happening, at this very same time, there's also another side event on climate and health. Well, how far do you want to go, including all kinds of discussions on climate and health in this kind of work? Or... Um, Recovery, which is also proposed by member states, how far do you go by recovering or strengthening health systems in countries? So I think most issues are on the table, but the, w the way you will handle them, that, that, could be, um, well, that could be done in different ways. Uh, no, thank I concur with Roland. I think most of the issues that uh, we need to address are on the table. Uh, we must remember also that um, the IHR itself is an extremely um, well-written document. The issue always was the implementation of the IHR. Yes, we need to update some of the uh, articles in relation to uh, new, uh, new uh, advancement in public health, but the essence is how to implement the IHR effectively how to uh, get uh, uh, I mean the work of the IHR be implemented in the ground. Uh, as always, there will be gaps, but the major uh, failures that we had in the pandemic were already covered by the existing uh, IHR. They need, um, we need together to work on implementing the IHR and uh, uh, in, in the same time, uh, the pandemic as it's, uh, as a, a pandemic is not really, um, it, it will need a different set of, uh, of regulations and uh, um, uh, commitments from the international um, community that, is, that will never be covered by the IHR itself. Uh, a pandemic is a different stage of, of, uh, uh, of the disease that is uh, uh, not, uh, will never be covered by uh, a, a thing that we are doing on daily uh, day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Dan Barbara. Uh, je voudrais uh, répondre à notre collègue de Canada. First of all, I'd like to respond to the comment from Canada regarding complementarity and uh, the uh, loopholes or gaps. Complementarity uh, obviously refers to uh, complementarity between Geneva and New York. Uh, in New York, uh, we do, I'm not going to say we, we play politics, but we do make political declarations which send clear political signals which represent the commitments of our heads of state. It does not, or has, does not much to do with the commitment of ministers or um, uh, other stakeholders. It has to do with heads of state. Uh, it represents commitment at a national level, but we also have to talk about an international uh, commitment. Uh, 
when it comes to the two processes that are underway currently in Geneva. And our wish here would be to be able to support them, to give them the political support necessary so that they can move forward in their respective negotiations and stick to uh, the uh, deadlines of uh, next May, next year, regarding these, uh, these gaps. Well, yes, obviously there are gaps because there's a, a lack of uh, consistency between uh, decisions made and uh, what is afterwards adopted at the level of uh, Geneva for uh, delegations that have uh, accepted certain principles, uh, for example, when it comes to uh, equity or uh, fair access to countermeasures. Afterwards, uh, they uh, are against them in the New York Declaration. This is where we see a clear gap. It has to do with the political understanding of health. Uh, it has to do with how we understand international cooperation, uh, assistance when it comes to health sovereignty, but also has to do with vaccine sovereignty. When we talk about complementarity between processes, obviously each process has its dynamic, its own ma uh, mandate and objectives. Uh, however, what we see is that uh, we often run into uh, problems because we have delegations that run into uh, principles that they support in the World Health Assembly, but then they do not accept them in the General Assembly of the United Nations. We hope that these inconsistencies, these gaps, uh, will be reduced, not at the level of negotiations, but at the level of within each and every delegation at also, and also at the level of capital. Thank you. Very helpful comment there about, first of all, needing heads of state in, involved in all of this, but actually, the, you, you know, the point you're making about in-country uh, getting agreement about what everybody is signing up to and, and what they really want, that's very, very important. I've got three um, more uh, uh, people who would like to speak, and probably after that, that we will have to draw this to a close. Um, the next one, please, is the Russian um, Federation. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you. And, uh, mm, and thank you for organizing this event, and I will continue in Russian. I think translation is working. Yes? So, спасибо за организацию. Thank you for organizing this event, and also thank you for the inspirational speeches uh, from all of the panelists and the Bureau. We think that this is a very important process particularly uh, the amendments to the IHR and the drafting of a new agreement, many countries are actively participating in these two processes. On one hand, this is good because it shows interest and the importance of this. On the other hand, this is a reason for achieving, well, this process for achieving these goals will not be easier because there are a lot of contradictions hidden within which cannot be resolved without real compromise when some countries are trying to support equity and access to technologies, others are insisting on uh, obtaining data and responsibility. And s there are some countries that are looking at uh, maintaining their sovereignty, like my country. The draft agreement already contains more than 100 pages, and it raises a number of issues. The proposed amendments to the IHR also is, uh, n is not so clear-cut. Will we manage within the time as we have set ourselves to achieve this, these goals? Russia has already proposed considering the possibility of adopting a framework convention and all the instruments that we cannot agree on before 2024, then we can fine-tune them after that. So, I agree that we shouldn't be delaying this, but we shouldn't. We need to be thinking about the interests of all countries because this is a multilateral process. Uh, otherwise, the instruments won't work. We need to have collective ambitions, not individual ones. The issue of how to achieve what the what we have set for ourselves by 2024. What do we consider to be a success for that? Would that be a document, a new agreement, which will be universal? Can, will it be universal if it's only adopted by a certain number of states? And if countries cannot implement it, is that a success? 
And finally, I would like to thank the Bureau of the uh, Working Group on IHR for their real uh, boldness of spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my last two um, interventions will be from Women in Global Health and Israel. Women in Global Health. Can you put your flag up and wave? I don't need to stand. Can you, I hope you can hear me. I'm Dr. Shabnam Sarfaraz and I am Global Director, Gender and Health for Women in Global Health. And I also had the privilege to lead the national portfolios for gender, health, and education at the government of Pakistan and lead the COVID-19 response. Listening to the Minister Bhutan when she mentioned a population of 700,000, it reminded me of Pakistan battling with a population of 230 million. Despite the weak health infrastructure, the critical shortage of health human resource, and the complexities involved, Pakistan was able to offer a robust, comprehensive, and effective national response. Dr. Tedros listed Pakistan as being amongst the top seven countries whose response offered lessons. Response which was delivered globally by a health workforce who are 70% women, rarely seen on the policy tables. Response which was delivered to 50% of the population by community health workers who again are majorly women, women who were not protected, not prepared. These lessons need to be documented, facilitated by those who led them. Their insights must guide development of our pandemic response set strategies. Member states must also look into how the governments organize their resources and work strategically with partners and building resilience. It is only together we could and it's only together we shall. Thank you. Thank you and Israel. The fact that we had destroyed hundreds of millions of vaccine doses and we are still destroying each month millions of vaccines means that we failed both in aspects of equity and aspects of efficiency. And that should be part of the lessons that we are discussing now. We have two short technical uh, comments. The first one is uh, many of us had responded to the draft both of the uh, IHR and the INB. Uh, please send an updated draft as soon as possible so we could recommend and push this process ahead, hopefully having meaningful draft before the September uh, New York meeting. The second point for us is that we do recognize mismatch in wording between the IHR and the treaty. That is contraproductive and we have to or eliminate these sentences in one of these uh, uh, processes or otherwise synchronize more uh, efficiently between the two uh, drafts. Thank you. Again, thank you. Um, now, I'm uh, going to ask um, Dr. Al Mantari, who is Regional Director for the WHO Regional Office, to give a few concluding remarks before I bring us finally to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for giving me the opportunity. And I'm really inspired by the remarks, comments, interventions given by members of the panel roundtable discussion, as well as by your good self, your, your excellencies. In fact, from things that I have heard, uh, it showed to us how important the ongoing work that, you know, we need to strengthen pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response, which is, you know, for, for the future of the world, for the future of, of our generations. Delivering on these uh, processes is a promise from leaders to people around the world on how we can do things better based on the lessons that we have learned from COVID-19 and from whatever outbreaks, pandemics that we have been suffering for the last many years. Uh, and again, you know, based on reflections from every one of you, we are not starting from scratch. In fact, you know, we have many tools and technologies that we have developed, especially for the last four years when it comes into COVID-19, that you know, we need in order to prepare for pandemic better, as you all have mentioned, detect them earlier, respond to them faster, and communicate their impact to, to our communities, to our you know, experts, leaders, everyone. Throughout the pandemic, we have built 
own and ex expanded the capacities you know, at all levels, at different areas of healthcare system, as well and as non-healthcare system. To share with you an example from the Eastern Mediterranean region, which I am coming from, we managed to develop 20 in, in, you know, 21 out of the 22 member states in the Eastern Mediterranean region you know, to, to have the genomic sequencing capacities in these countries. It used not to be the case before COVID-19. 12 of these countries have functioning emergency operation centers, not used to be the case before COVID-19. There has been tremendous expansion in risk communication, IBC, ox IBC oxygen generation, and critical care capacities. What we need now, and it is the most critical point of all work that we do, we need to sustain whatever investments in these gains, and we don't want to go back to the baseline. Otherwise, it will be a huge waste on our time, resources, financial, non-financial. So this is the key thing that we need to maintain. We need also to better coordinate. We need uh, more trust among ourselves within the same country, between countries, between regions, at a global level. We need more equity, as have been mentioned, and I'm really very heartbroken, you know, by the story that, you know, our dear sister, um, Dr. Alakaya Kega, you know, mentioned. It is unfair, and there are many stories around the globe that have happened. We need more solidarity to make sure that those tools are used as effectively as they could be. It is our moral duty to ensure that this is happening all the time, at all levels in different localities around the globe. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I come again, you know, as I told you, from a region that is very diverse and unique. The Eastern Mediterranean region includes some of the richest and some of the poorest countries. It includes some of the most peaceful and some of the most conflict-ridden areas in the world, and the list is, is ongoing. I don't want to, to, you know, waste your time. When COVID-19 hit, the impact was felt by every country, every community, every individual in these communities, uh, either in, in our region, EMRO, or other regions. Despite our challenges, we came together with our member states to tailor the response to the specific context of each individual country. An external review of the WHO's response across the region indicated that 80% of external stakeholders stated that WHO met or exceeded their expectations which is very rewarding to us. We know that when given the resources and access to those in need, we can achieve tremendous outcomes. We should really trust on our, our capacities, our, our insight, to make sure that we will make ch changes. As we conclude this strategic round table and return to our daily businesses, including meetings, events, etc., we must ask ourselves one key question or a few key questions. What will be the concrete benefit of you know, the work that we, we, we do, or we are going to do here, which means that for the people of our region and beyond, you know, uh, expecting and putting high expectations on us. So what, what does that mean? What are we, our next step? Will our work contribute to a healthier, fairer, more equitable world? The problem of inequity, as I have mentioned and has been raised by, by, by some members, is very much what cost the world so many lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only address this weakness, a challenge, by pursuing multiple pathways to ultimately enhance the world's capacity to better respond next, next time. Otherwise, we'll be losing a lot of lives you know, unnecessarily. We need real-time and equitable sharing of information and pandemic-related products. And this will definitely help us in building more trust and solidarity, help us in saving lives, help us in protecting livelihoods, and end pandemics more quickly. The work of the INP and its potential contribution cannot be underestimated in this regard, and it should be really supported. And sh we should be optimistic in making it moving forward. We need capacities, systems, and tools for early detection, early warning, laboratory capacities, regulatory capacities, supply chains and logistics, continuity of care, manufacturing capacities, and know how that are strategically and geographically distributed in a very equitable way. We need cooperation, collaboration, and coordination within 
between and among countries and partners, as, as you have mentioned, Barbara, uh, earlier in the, in the meeting. We need sharing of knowledge and technology with those who have least access to them. And that was one of the challenges that we have been facing during COVID-19. We need to invest in co-development of technologies, cooperation, and research and development, and make sure that these sort of capacities are also given to countries that are lacking them now. We need to develop them. We must start realizing uh, financing as an investment. Any investment in pandemic prevention and preparedness today will definitely yield a high return on investment during the response. Above all, it will save valuable lives. Chart the, we need also, we must chart the way for sharing and, so, and for sharing and solidarity with the convention that no one is safe until everyone is safe. At, and to conclude, as His Excellency as Ambassador mentioned, we need political commitment at the highest level to deliver on the promise of a safer and fairer tomorrow for our children, our grandchildren, and generation to come in the future. Thank you very much, Barbara. Back to you. Thank you. Now, to, fin to finish us off, I'd say there's been a lot of energy in the room, and I think that's really fantastic because we're going to need a lot of energy to get there uh, in the end. But it's great to have that, and I hope you know, that what the people have been saying is really encouraging to those who've got to work and manage this through. It's really, really very um, inspiring in a way to do that. The only thing I would say just at the end of it, just let's keep remembering the people and what they went through and how they feel about it and how they can engage um, as a part of this as we go through these complex, difficult negotiations. But really, I wish you all the best in doing that. And I'd, because the panel have been so good and being so, so on time for everything, I'd just like to ask you to give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.